So I want to start with a story that has been uh, going around in the, the news, and you may have seen it this past week. This is a story about a man who goes to a doctor. A man was very depressed. He says his life seems very harsh and cruel. He says he's, he feels all alone. And uh, he's living in a very threatening world. And the doctor tells him, here's this treatment. The treatment is very simple. There's a great clown in town called uh, Pagliacci. He's in town tonight. And so here's my prescription to you. Go and see him. People are going to see Pagliacci every night by the droves. And they are just splitting their sides in laughter and in joy. So go see Pagliacci tonight. That should pick you up. And the man bursts in tears and he says, But doctor, I am Pagliacci. Um, <clears throat> this week we, we uh, have heard the news of Robin Williams' death. And it struck me a little bit different than uh, a lot of the Hollywood deaths do. And I, I've discussed with a lot of people why we think that is. Uh, maybe because one, it was an intentional taking of his life. Two, maybe it's because it's someone that a lot of us have grown up with. Back from uh, Happy Days and Work and Mindy all the way through what he's he's been doing in the motion pictures and I, I don't know exactly what it is but what it has done it's brought a lot of tears it's brought a lot of confusion uh, a lot of misunderstanding a lot of anger a lot of finger pointing a lot of judging and a lot of conversation about this topic of depression and so I want to take some time this morning and just get a glimpse into this idea of depression and um, maybe a, a biblical way that we can approach it. So if you'll pray with me. Our dear Father, we, we come to you this morning and uh, we come to you humbly and just like the song was saying, Lord, we, we come to you because uh, we are broken and, and we want to know how to love like you do. And we want to, to know and feel that we are loved and Lord, we want to see the next step. And um, I'm going to paraphrase the prayer that I was looking for. It was given to me by a friend who's sitting back there at the sound t table there. But Lord, may, may it be my, or may it be your words that come out today, not mine. Lord, where, where I stutter, may, may people hear your voice. And, and when I stumble, may people think it's a dance for you. And, and so Father, we just, we come to you this morning and just we want to hear you and hear your message. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about joy this year. We're, we're seeing joy in, in our faith. And there's a very real obstacle for a lot of people to the, to the idea of finding joy. That's my trademark, by the way. Uh, and that obstacle is this, this depression. And... The problem, one of the problems, uh, one of the aspects of depression is that it's, it's really widespread. It's, it's something that a lot of people deal with. Uh, it's affecting a whole lot of people in this room. And whether it's right now or whether sometime in the past, a whole lot of people have, have, have dealt with this issue. Now, depression can come on from, from several different ways, a lot of different ways, and, and some of it is situational. Maybe it's the loss of a relationship or a loved one. Maybe it's a major change in your life that's caused uh, depression to set in. Maybe it's um, clinical depression where the person can't even begin to tell you why they feel depressed. There's no explanation, no understanding behind it, which in itself can be very frustrating. And it's not always an obvious thing. Um, we think somewhere in our minds that if someone is depressed that we're going to notice it. We're going to see it. And so because we walk around in our daily lives and we don't see people who are just broken down in tears, we don't think that this is a very prevalent idea. And that's just simply not true. Like Robin Williams, we can look back now in hindsight and say, oh, well, he hit it with his humor. 
And a lot of people hide their depression through a variety of ways. I, I want to share just a little bit uh, because I feel like I'm a pretty average guy. I feel like that I don't have a, a life that is, that is uh, wildly different than anybody else in this room. And I want to just give you a, a minute of a glance into what my family has dealt with or is dealing with. My grandfather committed suicide. My wife's grandfather committed suicide. My son dealt with a period of time where he was considering suicide. My wife, uh, years ago when, when our youngest daughter went into school, and, and this is how this can go so clothed and, and unknown, I had no idea, but for a year she had a bout of, of serious depression. Uh, I would get up in the morning and go to work, and uh, we would take the kids to school, and she stayed in bed until right before I got home. And I, I wasn't aware of that for a year. And, and so, and again, I, I say this and I share this because I don't think that I'm any different than anybody else. I think everybody in this room either has dealt with it or, or knows someone who has. And, um, and we hide it. Despite that fact, we hide it. We don't tell people what we're going through. We don't tell people what our family members are going through. And, and part of that is because I think that there's a huge misunderstanding about what depression is. And because it's misunderstood, then we don't tell people. And because we don't tell people, then on top of being, having depression, it becomes a very lonely place. And, and, I, and if you've never had it, let me just, just explain just a little bit about it. Because depression is not just sadness. That's not what depression is. Depression is not just, just loneliness. And it's not just helplessness. It, it is those things, but they don't begin to explain it. Uh, one woman describes it this way. She said, depression is like a room engulfed in flames and you can't breathe for the sooty smoke that's smothering you limp. Now this is an image that really uh, speaks to me personally because I had an instance uh, when I was a police officer. I used to be a police officer and for the first six years of, of my job as a police officer, my job was to drive the scout car. Which means that when there was a, a person who was deceased, it was my job to transport them. I was called to a house fire where I had to transport an infant child to the morgue. And this infant child was found below her mother. Her mother had gone back into the house to get the child and she had got trapped in the room and, and she was inundated with smoke. She couldn't see and when they found her, the child was on the floor and she was down on all fours crouching around protective way around the child. And when we went in to get this child, the lady was literally two feet from a window. She could have just cut out the window. And that's kind of what we think about people who are going through depression. We, we, we were well-wishers and we, we maybe with good intentions, but we say things like, well, why don't you just? Why don't you just get over it? Why, why don't you just uh, ignore the circumstances that are making you sad? Why don't, why don't you just stop it? But that's kind of like telling this woman, why don't you just breathe in the middle of this house fire? Why don't you just see the doorway when she didn't have the ability to see it? She, didn't ha she couldn't see the window. Now, when we stand on the outside and the smoke is cleared, we think it's obvious, but it's not obvious when you're in the midst of it. And so people, they suffer in silence. I mean, they want help. They don't like suffering. People who are going through the depression aren't enjoying this. 
People are, uh, say, I, I wish I could just stop. I wish I could just breathe. And so, again, they suffer in silence. While we on the outside sometimes say, all you have to do is... All you have to do is snap out of it. All you got to do is just stop being lazy. Just get up and go. Get out of the house. All you got to do is just stop being a selfish drama queen. Or king. Just, just stop it. Just stop. I want to tell you here, I sure am glad that our Lord doesn't treat us like that. I sure am glad that our God doesn't approach us that way. I'm sure I'm glad that God doesn't just come to us and say, hey, hey, just, just stop being a sinner. And we, God, I don't want to be a sinner. I want to stop. I, I, I can't. I don't know how. We'll just stop. That's not our God. That's not our Jesus. And I thank the Lord that he didn't come to, at us that way because he came to us when we were broken. He came to us when we were sick. He came to us when we were lost. And he didn't just come to us during those times. He came to us because of that. To walk alongside of us. Unfortunately, when our faith and our depression collide, sometimes I've seen some of the most compassionless, heartless comments come from ignorant Christians, myself being one of them. Because as Christians, we throw out this idea of Jesus and God, and, and we think that this is going to somehow just fix the problem. And so, well, if you're depressed, all you need to do is believe in Jesus. And they come back and someone says, I do, I do believe in Jesus. And well, apparently you just don't believe in him enough. And that's a lie. That's a lie. And I want to, if you're suffering from it now, or if you've ever used that, for that excuse or, or argument against someone, it's a lie that you can't be a Christian and suffer from depression. That you can be a Christian. It's a, you can believe in Jesus and have depression. You know, we believe in Jesus, and uh, uh, how many people in here have been sick physically? Okay? You can believe in Jesus and be sick, and that's what depression is. It is a mental sickness, a mental illness. It is not a choice. If people are depressed, we say, well, just go and pray about it. Pray about it, and, and, and it will be gone. And you say, I do. Well, apparently you're not praying in faith. That is a lie. That is what Satan wants to use against us to hold you down. Listen, prayer is not a vending machine. You cannot go to God and say, God, uh, fix every problem in my life and have every problem in your life fixed. It's not room service. And, and sometimes we go to people and this, is, this is, comes straight out of the book of Job. Well, if you're depressed, then you've got some sort of hidden sin in your life. Now, when Job's friends tried to use that against Job, God showed up and smacked him in the head. God himself said, that is a lie. It doesn't mean that you have hidden sin just because you're dealing with depression. And so because of, of, of comments like these, sometimes we have made the church not a real soothing place to come to when we're dealing with it. The message is, uh, so oftentimes, hey, listen, it's your fault and God's not on your side while you're going through this. And that is so entirely, absolutely contrary to Jesus Christ. Because the Jesus Christ that I believe in and that we, we teach and preach and proclaim here in these four walls is not the Jesus Christ that turns his back on people who are suffering. He himself said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. 
Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. He came for the people who are dealing with this, this illness and, 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 and are just lost in life. In fact, when he stood up in the temple or in, in, in the synagogue and his first public display of who he was, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed. If that doesn't describe a person who is going through depression... And then what he did, and I love this, is when he was talking to his disciples and he said, he, he breathed on them and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you've ever suffered from depression, if you've ever talked to somebody about it, one of the things that people say over and over and over again is, I can't breathe. I can't even breathe. And Jesus Christ gives that breath of life. Now, here's what I want to say, because uh, what does all this mean? Does this mean that, um, you know, the dogmatic Christians are right? That, that if you're suffering, then apparently you're not listening to Scripture? And, and absolutely not. That's not what that says at all. Because um, Scripture is definitely the truth of God. Faith is your first and foremost, that's the first thing you have to do, is have faith in Jesus Christ. By all means, but, but faith was never an issue in Scripture where you say, hey, you have faith and then you're done. Faith was always an issue of have faith and then go. When a man has leprosy, Jesus says, have faith and then go wash in, in the Jordan. When a man was blind, Jesus said, have faith and, 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 and puts mud on his eyes and says, now go and wash. Have faith and then go and do. And so we can look at Scripture because Scripture tells us that it is a, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Which means that you look to Scripture for guidance and then it will tell you your next step. It will tell you where to go. What's the next thing to do? And it tells us, seek prayer. Seek prayer. If you're going through a difficult time, James 5.13 says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Seek counsel. Talk about it. Open up. It is a darkness. And Jesus Christ came as the light. Bring the things to the light. And it helps. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying these are guarantees. I'm not offering platitudes. And I'm not saying that, hey, if you just do these things, if you, if you follow steps A, B, and C, then you're going to be fine. Because, listen, we are broken. Scripture tells us, it explains that we're a broken people. We're a broken race. We suffer. And it won't always be that way. And, and He has eternity waiting for us where He's promised us that those things, the suffering, it's not going to be there. But there's, there's possible, there's potential, there's, there's real relief in this life if we will reach out. Seek counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Bring it to light. Talk with a friend. Seek an actual counselor. Come and talk with someone at church. Come and talk to me. Be transparent. And here's one. This is, oh, this is such a huge pet peeve of mine. Seek medication. Oh, I cannot tell you how many people have come to me and said, oh, because I'm a Christian, I can't take medication. I really want to pull out a sledgehammer and break their leg and then say, are you going to go see a doctor now? Because I bet you do. If your leg's broken, you go to a doctor. There's no, we don't question that. 
If there's something physically wrong, then you go to the doctor. It's okay. Medication is okay. Scripture tells us medication is okay. Over and over again, bombs and oils and alcohol are used in Scripture as medication. It's okay. It doesn't deny God. We go back to this idea of have faith in God and then go. Have faith in God and then seek medication. Just because it's an issue that's from the neck up doesn't mean that, well, I can't get medication, no. If we have issues from the neck down, we seek medication. We're okay with that. It's not a denial of God to take medication. Many times there is a very real chemical, physical issue that is going on that can be corrected through medication. And, and I am telling you, it's okay. Scripture is telling you it is okay. Not me. God is telling you it is okay to take medication. Jesus Christ likened himself to a physician. If a physician was a bad thing, Jesus would not have likened himself to a physician. Proverbs says, A joyful heart is good medicine. It's likening it to medicine. It's a good thing. Paul tells Timothy, hey, uh, use a little bit of wine for the sake of your stomach if you're having frequent ailments. If you're having stomach problems, drink a little bit of wine because that alcohol is medicine and it will kill the, the, the bacteria and, and whatnot in the stomach. And it's good medicine. But sometimes we get so stubborn and we get so caught up and, and, and one woman said, I'd rather walk tall with a crutch, using medicine, than crawl around insisting like a proud and bloody fool that I didn't need one. Please, it's okay. And now here's the thing. I've given you three things to go and do. And I know that in the midst of depression, the idea of going and doing anything sometimes is just absolutely not possible. The fact that you're sitting here, if you're hearing this message today, might just be a flat-out miracle that you're here. That you got out of bed this morning. And so, if that's the case with you, and you don't have the ability to pray, or to go to a doctor, or to seek counsel, then I just ask you to gasp loudly. Let someone around you know what you're going through. Let someone around you hear your pain. And then it becomes incumbent upon us to respond. We need to watch for people who are going through this. And we need to remove the shame from this whole thing. We've got to stop uh, making people feel ashamed because they're going through this. Or judging people because they're going through this. So many people this week, you've seen them judging and shaming uh, Robin Williams for and what he's gone through. And, and, and Rick Warren, if you don't know who he is, a pastor of one of the largest churches in the country, America's pastor, his son committed suicide. We've got to remove this stigma. Galatians 6.2 tells us, bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. If someone's having a difficult time, we should stand next to them and help bear their burdens. 1 John 3.17 says, but whoever has the world's goods, now listen, I know this says world's goods, but if it's telling you, if you've got food, and it's telling you to share your food, the verse says, if you, whoever has the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? If you've got food that you can offer to someone, and it's, this statement is talking about that, how much more an open ear I read about a man who put an ad in a newspaper said, hey, listen, I'll listen to you for 30 minutes without comment. That's all he said. Put an ad in the newspaper. For 30 minutes without comment, I'll listen to you for five bucks. He was getting 10 to 20 phone calls a day. We could just be an open ear for people. The 34th Psalm says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. 
The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I would love to say, uh, hey, listen, here's the scripture that will solve all your problems. I would love to say, here's the prayer that will fix you. Here's the, uh, the oil that if, I, if you're anointed with it, it will, it will clear it all up. But we live in a broken world. We live with a world of pain and illness and sickness. In the New Testament, the phrase cry out is used over and over and over again by people who are calling out to Jesus. The lepers, the sinners, the sick, the blind. Every day they suffered in silence on the roadsides. They became fixtures. Nobody noticed them. They were almost hidden. No one understood them. But when the love of Jesus was within reach, they cried out. They cried out for help. They cried out for the love of Jesus. They used their limited energy, limited strength to make themselves known. I know that there are people here today that are suffering from depression. And I know that there are many here that have suffered from it in the past. And I know that that because of that, many people have felt shame about it. I want to ask that if you're feeling it now, if you've ever felt it, if you have a loved one who has suffered from depression, I want to invite you to stand and make yourself known and battle against this idea that it is a shameful thing and so that you can give courage to someone else to stand. If you've ever suffered from it before, if you suffer from it now, if you have a loved one who's ever suffered from it, you're not alone. You're not the only person who's gone through this. Let's break the chains. Let's stop the stereotypes. Let's let's shed light on the shadows that bind. Let's pray. Our dear Father, I want to ask for your healing touch. Lord, I want to pray that you would, for the people here who are dealing with this depression, that I thank you that they've had the courage to stand up. And if they didn't, I I thank you that those around them did and so they can see they're not alone. Lord, we don't understand this. It, It is such a complicated issue. I know it begins in our faith. And, and I know that that's not uh, uh, going to eradicate it. I know that we can have faith in you and still suffer from depression. So, Lord, I pray that, that we can bond, bond together, that, that, that we can come to the aid of those who need help. And, Lord, that we can just be there. We don't have to fix anything. We can just be with them. Again... Lord, I I pray it's it's your message and your presence that fall upon these hearts because um, I really don't have any other answers than that. Your presence. Thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.